Amen. So I never really like to get off the resurrection, um, that, that, that series of seven weeks between what we celebrate as Easter in the culture, but Passover in the Jewish culture and in the Bible, the freedom of coming out of Egypt and then the freedom of being forgiven of our sins. Ironic, right, that they went through the Red Sea and that we get saved through the red blood of Jesus, and that's what washes us clean. And there's seven weeks between when he resurrects and then for 40 days he appears to them, and then they're waiting, and then 50th day, Jubilee, on the Feast of Pentecost, what they would be celebrating would be the receiving of the law when Moses went up on the mountain and came down for the law. We celebrate as Jesus going up to the Father and sending down the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost that we celebrate in Acts chapter 2. I'm not going to steal any thunder from Isaac Petrie, not that I could anyway, but he'll talk about that on Sunday. But I just have always been... Um, I guess maybe questioning why Jesus would have waited. That's the question I'm going to ask tonight. Why did Jesus wait to raise Lazarus from the dead? I think there might be some insight here that we can look at, and, and that will help us, give us hope, that no matter what the situation is, that God is able to still turn that thing around. Amen? Because even when it was over for Lazarus, it wasn't over. And Jesus was in the tomb three days. Lazarus was in the tomb four days. And they were really concerned, and they were upset, and like, boy, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. So let's look at some of these verses and see, and I put a question mark here because it says the sickness of Lazarus unto death. Well, yes, but no, because it's not over even when it's over with God. It's not over, amen? His life was over, but there's resurrection power, and Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says his sickness will not end in his death, but will bring great glory to God. How do we apply that right now today to our lives, to the people that we know, to the ones that we minister to? Maybe you're on our prayer ministry team, and you're here on a Sunday morning, and, and a new person that's never been here before comes up for prayer, and they tell you their story. That sickness that they're dealing with doesn't even have to be a physical sickness. It could be an emotional problem that they're dealing with. It could be grief that is just overweighing people to the point where they don't know what to do. They've come to their wit's end. And many people have taken their lives when they get to that place. More so in the last two years than I think ever before is people have been overcome with not knowing how to handle things. How can we give them hope that it's never too late with God? That you can believe that this sickness is not going to end in death. But by your healing, by your resurrection, by the turnaround that God's going to bring, you're going to bring glory to God. Now Jesus knew that, that Lazarus would be raised from the dead. It says, as these events unfold, the Son of God will be exalted. And I'm trying to just help us see this is for today. This is not just Lazarus. This is what it's like to live as a Christian with the hope that no matter what, how bad the situation is, we speak the, the faith of God over that situation. We say, God calls those things that are not as though they are. God is going to be exalted through this situation. Now, you know, in verse 5, it says, Jesus dearly loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Several times it's mentioned that he's at their house, and everybody gets on Martha's case for being too busy. But uh, look, she's in the Bible, so let's honor her too. Mary chose the better thing to be at the feet of Jesus. But this is different. This says after receiving this news, right, that their brother Lazarus was sick. After receiving this news, Jesus waited two more days where he was. And that's the question. Why? Why did he wait two more days? We'll try to get to that today. Jesus, speaking to the disciples, said, now, after those extra two days, it's time to return to Judea. Just a little bit of a flashback. I don't know about you, but there's been steps in my walk with the Lord where I didn't understand a lot of things. And then the longer I've served him and the more preaching I've heard and the, the more mature I got in the Lord, things that used to confuse me don't confuse me the same way. But I sure don't have all the answers. If you do, please pray for me after the service. But none of us really fully arrive. And there were times when it specifically says in the Bible, like in Mark 8, 31, he went on to teach them, the disciples, many things, how the Son of Man would suffer, how he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, how he would be killed, and how after three days God would raise him from the dead. 
right? Now, that's a whole mouthful for these apostles who were not trained theologians. All of them, at the time when he says this, Paul's not on the scene yet. All of them are working class people. They're out of the marketplace. He didn't go to Bible college for any of these folks. They're regular people like you and me. They're marketplace people. Some of them, like Matthew, if you watch The Chosen, you really get a feel for how much animosity there could have been towards Matthew as a tax collector, right? And uh, what a, I highly recommend watching The Chosen. But one chapter later, right down to the verse, he says the same thing. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of the people, and they will kill him. And after he's killed, he will rise on the third day. But verse 32, but again, they did not understand his meaning. <laughs> that happens to all of us, right? We, we hear it, and we process it, but it doesn't sink all the way down because it's so hard for us to shift our paradigm. And I've, I've started to think about paradigm as, as kind of an older word now. Algorithm is the word that the, that the culture uses now because of all the social media stuff and the algorithms. And, and we can change our algorithm. We can get a new download. We can, we can download that spyware that will recognize the viruses in us, and God will change the algorithm of our lives. And instead of going to default to sin mode, I default to the grace of God and the mercy mode and forgiveness mode. And Lord, right, right in that moment, I apologize. I repent. Please come and fill me. Less of me, more of you. I'll take that one all day long. So it wasn't like he had never told them this was going to happen. But right there in Mark 9.32, it says they didn't understand his meaning. And I'm going back to something I did a couple of weeks ago because this chart helps me think about this whole process of what I wrote there, the recurring death, burial, and resurrection of believers. For those of you that, are, that have taken our... Uh, originally called Elijah House and then Possessing Your Vessel Classes, the books that we recommend that all the people that want to be involved here in leadership have to read this book and try to grasp the concepts that are, that are dealt with in that book. Some people would call it inner healing, but I think it's much bigger than just inner healing. I think it's actually deconstruct, deconstructing the things that don't line up with the word, letting them die, and then resurrecting the new Peter on the other side of that cross. And we don't just band-aid it. We're not just putting a band-aid on it. We're allowing it to die. And I'm putting the recurring death, burial, and resurrection because as we get healed and the Lord deals us with one area, there's another area that will get revealed. And instead of feeling discouraged by that, we actually learn to, to ask him to show us the next thing that he wants us to purge out of our lives. Is anybody going to say amen tonight for anything I say? Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Initially, I was talking to somebody today, and they said, oh, my God, thank you, Lord. You got me out of that mess. And then Cindy Corman said to him at the time, oh, don't worry. He'll show you another one that you're going to have to deal with. And he was like, no, this was too painful. But... That's not the case because you start to realize, wait a minute, the devil had me down the wrong life path. And anything that's still in my life that's not redemptive, that's not in the image of Jesus, I want it out. Turn up the heat, Lord. Open up the windows. Let the light in. That's Easter's favorite song lately. Open up the windows. Let the light in. Let the light in. I don't care what pain I got to go through because the other side of the cross is so much better. Somebody's happy, not everybody. <laughs> I, want the, I want to bypass that crucifixion part. I just want the resurrection part. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't work that way. So this is what I did a couple weeks ago. We're, we're in this position, wherever that is today, right now, we're here. And we can either go backwards or forwards, but there's no neutral. You don't stay where you are. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards as it relates to being more like Jesus. That's our goal. Transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, NIV version. Transformed into your image, Lord, with ever-increasing glory. So he says one of these really heavy things like, to find your life, Peter, you must lose it which sounds like a contradiction, until you live the Christian life for a while. And then you realize that things that you thought were normal might have been normal in your family, but they're not normal in the family of God. And these habits that you formed, even though they're not leading you to be in jail, you're not breaking the law, maybe some families, like mine, maybe would have led you to jail, but no, but it's still not where he wants you to be. It's not the redemptive place that he has for you. So you have to come to grips with the fact, okay, maybe it's forgiveness. 
That's probably something we could all think about, that we had a hard time forgiving somebody who hurt us. Is that true? I'm trying to keep you guys awake by making you move your hands around a little. Okay? So, yeah, I don't find it easy to forgive. I don't think anybody finds it easy to forgive. You feel like you're letting that other person off the hook. But you realize the truth of this verse is, all right, if I really want to find my life in Christ, I've got to give this thing up. Holding on to this unforgiveness is poison in my system. So I'm going to let that thing die that I was holding on to. I'm not going to put a Band-Aid over it. I'm going to crucify it. So that's a downward move. And you say, I forgive that person, Lord. And you mean it. That's, that's that death and that burial of that thing. And thank God, like I said, we don't hit the floor. We hit a trampoline. <laughs> and that bounces us up to another level because we're not holding on to that unforgiveness anymore. So think of it like one of those air balloons, you just let go of some baggage so you're, you're higher up in the air. I mean, this doesn't ever have to change for the rest of your life here as a Christian. We didn't just get saved to go to heaven when we die. Amen, please? Amen? I'd rather go to heaven than hell. Believe me, I don't believe there's a purgatory, so it's one or the other. But he also gave us a mission while we're here. And it's not just to avoid hell. It's to live an abundant life. It's to be on the mission. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I send you, Coy. I'm sending you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. I'm not telling you to hide so you can avoid sin. I want you to engage with the world. And I want you to show them that the kingdom of God is better than the kingdom they're living in. And in order to do that, to go higher, I have to first go lower. I have to bring things to death and bury them and then ask him to resurrect the new me. And that's what this does. And then he gives you another one. He said, a new commandment I give you in John 13. And commandment's a serious word. They knew what commandments were. They were written in stone in the Old Testament. Now Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you number 11. You have to love others. That would be hard enough. But you have to love others the way I have loved you. And that's pretty hard, isn't it? Remember, Ron, Ephesians chapter 5, husband loves your wives the way Christ loved the church. What? I'm going to die for my wife? Well, in in this figurative form, yes, because you've now become one. So the old you is gone, and the new you is two. (laughs) Two that have become one. And you know what the Sanford said in that book? God has designed it so that he sets you up with a partner with whom you are perfectly designed to grind somebody's listening. It's a good thing, Tim. It really is. It's a good thing. Remember when David needed to get rocks, he didn't just pick something up when he wanted to kill Goliath. Where'd he go? To the stream, right? He knew that the the rocks in the stream already had been grinded down and they were a lot smoother from all that friction. So the next time you're having a fight with your spouse, say, thank you, Lord. You're knocking off those rough edges off of me right now. I'm going to count it all joy that I'm in this argument with Trisha right now. Not there yet. I'm getting there. We, don't have, we haven't had an argument in a long time, so maybe we'll have one now because I said that. <laughs> but I'm up on this higher level now, so I'm going to love others the way you have loved me, but man, that's hard because I like holding grudges, and I, I do judge the book by the cover sometimes. I shouldn't, but I form an opinion about people even though I know nothing about them but by the clothes they wear, by the tattoos that they have, by the car they drive, by the way they speak, they might lack education or the job that they have. And I was in a, um, a not-for-profit today down in Philly that is a thrift store, and they work with agencies uh, for special needs high school students to give them jobs in the public. And there was you know, somebody there, and we were filming while we were there, and you could tell he, he, he suffered from autism. And he's got a purpose. He's got a place to go. He's working. He's working in, in a field. And they're bringing the kingdom to that man. That, that man, God loves him as much as he loves everybody else on the planet. And they're putting him in a love environment because it's a Christian organization. So he's not, hopefully, if we're doing what this says, we're going to love him the way Christ loved us, unconditionally. But is that easy to do? No. Do you want to repent right now for how you feel about your boss? People that work at the church really have to think about this one. (laughs) Oh, no. 
all right, I'm going to love you the way Christ loved me. Even though that's impossible in the natural, I have to ask the Lord for grace to step beyond my ability and let his ability win. And you say, sorry, I judged you. You can think about the movie Hacksaw Ridge. The sergeant wanted to judge the guy. He said, I had you all wrong. I thought you were the biggest coward. Turns out you're the bravest guy in the whole troop. That takes a lot, doesn't it? He had to die to his pride that this guy wouldn't carry a gun, that made him a coward. Absolutely wrong, 100% wrong. We can be so wrong when we judge people. So pause before you do that, before you jump to conclusions. That's the way Jesus loved us. So again, judging has to die. And I have to start loving people the way Christ loved us. But I hit a trampoline again, and I go up to an even higher level than that. And then, like, who knows what we're becoming? Who knows what Lisa Melillo is becoming, what Trish is becoming, what Adriel is becoming? What I do know is I'm wanting to become more like Christ because I'm being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. So whatever it means is the old man still has to go. It doesn't mean that the sin that is going is as serious as when I first got saved, but there's still more nuanced levels that we can climb higher and be more like Jesus. And then we're even more effective for him. Amen? That could sound like a works mentality. I don't want it to sound like you're earning anything. We just sang it. I couldn't earn it, and I didn't deserve it. But if, if my point is correct that Jesus purposely waited an extra two days to prove something about the resurrection, how powerful the resurrection is, and I think it does, then no matter what we're dealing with it, like, again, like Cindy would tell you, Easter would tell you, all the people that do counseling here, a normal frustration for people is they'll, they'll get started with ministry and they'll see progress, and then they'll hit something and they feel like they hit a wall. And how come I'm not seeing more progress? What's wrong with me? I should be further along right now. Amen, Easter? Ever feel that way? You feel that way sometimes too? Okay. <laughs> Indeed. That's probably good. It's conviction. Conviction. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm becoming, but I know that I'm trying to be more like him. And that's, I quoted John 3.30 there with John the Baptist said, more of you, less of me. And I don't know what it looks like. You don't know what it looks like because if you did, you'd be working on it. But the fact that he wants to show you the next thing, it's not a bad thing. We're going to take it to the cross, and we're going to let it go, and we're going to let it die. And I've said this to many people that I've been ministering to. Look, the world's been waiting for the real you to come out of hiding because the devil has so many layers over you. But let that stuff go. Bring it to the grave. Let it die, and let, let's, let the world see what the real you has wanted to look like all along. In the spirit of the Lord, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, a release from bondage. I came to set the captives free, he says in Luke chapter 4, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, right? And then what are you waiting for is the rhetorical question. I won't go there right now. Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's saying, we're, you know, they thought when he said that he was just sleeping, that you know, he was just sick. And, and, and Jesus says, no, he's not sleeping, he's dead. And I'm grateful for your sakes that I was not there when he died. Now, that sounds a little confusing too, doesn't it? Like, what do you mean? I thought you wanted everybody healed. Now you will see and believe. Then he gets there and he's talking to Martha. And Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been with us, my brother would not have died. Even so, I still believe that anything that you ask of God will be done. Jesus says, your brother will rise to life. Everybody know this portion? And Martha says, I know he will rise again when everyone is resurrected on the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the source of all life. Can we say that together? Jesus, I am the resurrection and the source of all life. That would be a real good verse to memorize. Because no matter what has to die in you, it's not greater than Jesus being the source of all life. He's the resurrection. You give it to him, drug addiction, I don't care how bad it is to quit cigarettes or quit heroin or whatever the thing is, it's not stronger than the power of God in us. That's just proven. Even secular psychologists will say the only proven way for people to get off of alcohol consistently is the AA program. It's a spiritual awakening. That's the only way it happens on a consistent basis. They can't explain it. 
Because the Bible says the natural mind cannot grasp the things of the Spirit. And we have to be willing to just surrender and say, if I want to find the life you want for me, i got to lose the life that I thought I wanted for me. Because that was the wrong source. I was going to the wrong source. It wasn't you as a source of life. It was something else in the world. Everything else falls second to Jesus. Those who believe in me will live even in death. Man, that helps this cause, doesn't it? So even though you let that thing die, you're still living. In fact, you're living at a higher level because you let that thing die. Because it was born into our nature when we were born. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never truly die. Do you believe this, Martha? And we'll go on now to verse 40 just to keep it moving. And he said, remember, I told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So he stands in front of that tomb and he says, Lazarus, a little louder, please. Lazarus, thank you. We say it. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> Come on. That's a good one, isn't it? Lazarus, come forth. And Martha's like, it's going to stink. <laughs> and if you read the King James, by now it will stinketh. <laughs> right? And that's, that's the way sin smells to God. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think when they rolled that stone away and Jesus said, thank you for hearing me, it's because there was no odor. Because he had already been resurrected inside. When he said, Lazarus, come forth, he was restored. New creation. Any man be in Christ, new creation. That's what he does. He calls a thing that's not as though it is. That's speaking faith. Hmm. Then the man who was dead walked out of his tomb, bound from head to toe in a burial shroud. Know what a mummy looks like, right, in these stupid movies that we see. Like, you know, they're walking and they're all still wrapped up. And I won't go into a long teaching, but there's a whole reason why they do this. They didn't bury them in the ground. They would let them decompose inside these above-ground tombs. And then once all the, the flesh had been, whatever you call that, decomposed off of the bodies, and it was just bones, they would put the bones in a bone box. And the reason that they would perfume the body is because by now it stinketh, right? Like, they know that the decomposing body would smell and, and that's what we have to see sin as. It's a decomposition of the thing that God made. And we're not going to live in that decomposing state. We're going to be composed. We are his workmanship, poema. Isn't that an amazing word? That we're the poetry of God. We're the workmanship of God. And sin is what stains all of that. So the more we allow it to go, and look, when we're in that situation, it's very hard to unwrap yourself when you're wrapped up. So we need each other, don't we, church? Community is immunity from sin. Living in community with other believers that can unwrap that shroud off of you and say, hey, don't worry, man, I dealt with the same thing. You kidding? You don't even want to know what I was like. So don't be shamed by this thing. That's the devil trying to shame you. No condemnation. God is greater. Stop looking in the rearview mirror. Stop condemning yourself for what you did. You're a new creation now. Move forward. Let go of that garbage that's holding you back. Let me help you unwind this death burial cloth on you so you could see the light. What greater thing could we do for people? That's what deliverance does. It lifts the shroud off of them. And now they can see. And then Jesus says, untie him and let him go. And I would say that's a big missing point of the church today. If we're not untying people from their sin and letting them go, we're missing a point. And one of the ways, again, like I could just tell you that, um, that because we have a food pantry here, is that people that are in that position that where they need help, often they'll tell us when they go to the government for assistance, they get shamed. And when they don't get shamed because they're coming to a Christian organization, they recognize a difference. We could say we're treating everybody the same, but if you're looking down at somebody because they need help, then you're not flowing in that same way Jesus loved, right? The new commandment is I, you have to love everybody the way I love them. And that means you don't judge them because of their condition. But for the grace of God, that could be me. That could be you. Mother Teresa said in Calcutta there would be many formerly wealthy people that would be in the leper colonies 
Some were doctors that had been treating the lepers and then they caught the contagious leprosy and they went from having mansions and being wealthy to living in a leper colony. And she said in some ways it was worse for those people, having had it, to now having lost it compared to the people that never had it. I don't know. It's bad either way, isn't it? What are we here for? To make a difference. We're here to say there's good news. Not good advice. <laughs> it is good advice, but it's way more than good advice. There's good news. You don't have to stay where you are. We're going to help you unwrap that next layer of burial clothes that the devil keeps putting on you. So I just, it's so hysterical, isn't it? Like Jesus does this miracle. The guy was dead for four days, right? Like I said, Jesus was only going to be dead for three days. This is four days. And calls him out of the tomb, he comes out, he's completely healed, and the Pharisees say, what are we going to do about this man? He's performing many miracles. <laughs> like, wouldn't you be like, what do you mean? Like, what are we going to do? Let's find more dead people. <laughs> Let's go unwrap somebody that we loved that's gone. Like, wouldn't that be a good idea? If we don't stop this now, every man, woman, and child will believe in him. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's empty out the hospitals. Let's close all the bars. Nobody would look at pornography if they had been raised from the dead. Because they'd have seen heaven. Or hell. Either way. <laughs> then they say, uh-oh. Do you know what will happen next? The Romans will think he's mounting a revolution and they'll destroy our temple. It will be the end of our nation. See how power feels threatened when something comes and challenges the paradigm. And the very God they were praying to was there in their midst. And the religious spirit had that cloth over their eyes. If he doesn't fit your model, it can't be God. Ouch. I won't go there. 49. Caiaphas, the high priest that year, said, you have no idea what you're talking about. What you don't understand is that it's better for you that one man should die for the people so that the whole nation won't perish. Ha! John says, his speech was more than it seemed. He was saying more than he knew. A high priest that year, Caiaphas, prophesied unknowingly that Jesus would die on behalf of the entire nation, not just for the children of Israel. That's you and me. If you're a Gentile and you're not born a Jew, we got grafted in, didn't we? Did we deserve that? No, the wild branch got grafted into the natural branch. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you listen to some, well, I won't go there either. He would die. <laughs> Crucify that, Lord. He would die so all God's children could be gathered from the four corners of the world into one people. Oh, that is just brilliant. That Caiaphas almost acted like a Cyrus in that moment. He was the chief enemy, and yet God was prophesying through him truth that he didn't even fully understand. God can use anybody. And how could he have said it and not fully realize the irony? And they already found this man's tomb. Like, this is, this is historical. They found his tomb within the last few years of Jerusalem. And look at the wording here. Oh, help us, Lord. Deliver us from the evil of a religious spirit. Because that's what these guys had. Cemented. In that moment, they cemented their intentions to have Jesus executed. Whew. God was in their midst. And they missed their day of visitation. So what about us? That's what we're here for tonight, not what happened back then. If there's a way that the things that are clouding our vision are stopping us from seeing the move of God, we should be grateful that he would show us what they are, even though we don't know what it's going to look like after we hit that trampoline. We're trusting by faith because whatever thing that he's removing from our lives, we got used to doing it that way. So even though it's not the best, at least we know how to do it. Talk about a dilemma. Paul's saying, oh my God, the things I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. How am I going to get delivered from this? Jesus, that's the answer. But boy, you need faith in order to go down so that you can go up. 
I got to be willing to let it go, let it die, and trust he's going to resurrect me on the other side, a different person. And, you know, what we've learned as well is that it takes a lot of courage for people to do that. And they're usually not very good at the new way right in the beginning when they're trying. So if anybody ever needs encouragement, it's those folks that recognize there was a problem and now they're trying a new way and they have to get new muscles down. Nobody's saying amen. I hope that's a good sign. 54. From that day forward, Jesus refrained from walking publicly among the people in Judea. I mean, they obviously knew that Jesus knew that they were after him. And he also knew there was a timeline. And he also knew that everything he was doing was a prophetic calendar. And if you wonder why, he would tell people, don't say anything about this miracle. And they would have to withdraw. It's because he was on a prophetic timeline. He set his mind to go to Jerusalem. He knew he was going to be crucified on the Passover. Not before, not after. And this was right before the Passover, as you'll see. He went to a small town. I won't go through all that, but then it says right there in 55, the Passover was approaching, and Jews everywhere traveled to Jerusalem early so they could purify themselves and prepare for Passover. And then just six days before the Passover feast, okay? So Lazarus had already been resurrected, and now Jesus is visiting them. He goes back to Bethany again, to their home, where, where Lazarus had recently been raised from the dead. See that word, recently? So really, if you think about why did he wait those extra two days, I believe that it was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen the following weekend. This was the Passover, the last Passover for Jesus. The week of the consumption of the reason he came was going to be completed that week. He would die on Friday and resurrect on Sunday morning, right? So like this is the weekend before and it says they hosted him. Again, they did that often. Mary and Martha and Lazarus hosted them often for dinner. It's really interesting to me, too, that when you read between the other verses I didn't give you, it says that the Jews were plotting to kill Lazarus again <laughs> because a lot of people were turning to God. And it's like, well, but if we do that, then Jesus is going to raise him again. He, just, he can't win this game. Man, any man believes in me, you live forever. Thank you, Lord. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If any man eats of this bread, he will live forever. You're a Christian now. You could be some poverty-stricken person in Calcutta, India. doesn't matter. God loves you. When uh, Heidi Baker's husband was speaking once about his grandfather who had been a missionary in China, one of the early missionaries in China, and there was a book that he wrote called Behind the Veil. And it's about how these kids in this orphanage had this appearance of angels on an on a extended period. And when people got there to interview them, they all gave the same exact story in different rooms. Like they were completely separated from each other. And it was very obvious that they all saw the same thing. And Roland's point was, when Jesus said, the least of these, my brethren... Jesus appeared to these kids who were the least in the whole world. They had climbed out of coal mining pit, pits that they were in and escaped. 10, 11, 12 years old, they were dying, and they just ran in order to try to live. They had nothing, and God appeared to them. Woo! Didn't take a whole lot of qualifications. He said, I'll never forget it. His grandfather said, I don't know, maybe there was somebody who was more least than those kids, but I don't think so. The least of these, my brethren, you're doing it unto me. And he appears to them. Hmm. Martha was busy serving as the host. That's no big surprise. They're having this dinner. Lazarus reclined at the table and said, boy, I'm sure glad you raised me from the dead, Jesus. And Mary took a pound of fine ointment and she wiped the feet of Jesus with her hair and the pleasant fragrance of the ointment filled the entire house. I mean, I could spend a lot of time on that. But look, she took something really valuable and worshiped the Lord in front of other people. And what happened? It stirred that religious spirit in who? Judas, verse 5. How could she pour out this vast amount of oil? Why didn't she sell it? It's worth a year's wages. And we all know what it says about Judas, right? He didn't care about the poor. He was stealing the money. The money could have been given to the poor. Well, no, sorry, Judas, we know. That ain't right. You don't believe that. 
Verse 7, leave her alone. She's observed this custom in anticipation of the day of my burial, which would be less than a week from this meal. But they, they still didn't fully understand. Remember, because on the road to Emmaus, Jesus comes up alongside them when he's resurrected, and they're like, man, like, he says, why are you so down? Well, because we thought he was the one. What do you mean? Didn't he tell you? He was going to have to suffer and die, but that God would raise him again. But we're a little thick, aren't we? We can be a little dense sometimes. And again, community is immunity. In person, get prayer. Let people lay hands on you. Come up to the altar during worship and just pour your heart out to God. I'm not saying you can't do that from home. I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but community means being together. And I would just highly encourage you to be together with other believers. It could be over a meal. It doesn't have to be just a church service. That would be great. But look, you know, being alone, we know it's not good for man to be alone, don't we? <laughs> and he said, she did this in anticipation of my burial. Again, the, anoint, the ointment was to keep the stench of the decomposing body. So she was making a prophetic act in advance, pouring out this expensive oil on him because you're never going to leave me, Jesus. I'm always going to remember you because you've stamped yourself into my life. So I know you're leaving, but I want to honor you with something I value. That's the sacrifice of praise. That's our worship. It's like incense that goes up to the throne. And he inhabits that. Isn't that amazing? From our heart. Can't, can't create it. You can't manufacture it. I'm going to finish in John. It says in John 20, on the first day of the week, that would have been the Sunday after the Passover Friday, the first day of the week. This is why Christians, like we believe, meet on Sunday because that was the day of the resurrection. The first day of the week is Sunday in their culture. And, you know, other people choose not to do that, whatever, that's not what I'm here to talk about, but this was the first day of the week. Now, if you remember back into the book of Genesis, on the first day, what happened? God spoke, right? And now there's a new dispensation, and after the resurrection happened, it's now a new dispensation, even though people don't realize it yet. The whole world has changed with the resurrection. Please don't lose this point. And why I keep staying on it, even though we celebrated it so long ago, but this week is, is the celebration of Pentecost, the Jubilee. The seven weeks is up. The Holy Spirit is given. It's good for you, Jesus said, that I go, because then the Father will send the Comforter. And greater things will you do. Wow. We have to take that by faith that that's true, because he said it. And now it's the first day of the week, and Mary Magdalene, and it says in another portion of Scripture, from whom Jesus had cast out, anybody? Seven demons. Huh. Could have judged her. That's another great episode of The Chosen. Caiaphas sees the change in her, knew that she had been filled with demons, separates, and then sees her again, and he's like, oh, my God. What happened to you? She's a different person. Same body, different spirit. How about you and me? Wouldn't it be evident? Something different. So here she is, Mary Magdalene, a terrible sinner. Seven demons, whatever that means. Seven's a number of completions, so who knows? Maybe she was completely full of demons. I don't know. She goes there early and sees that the stone has been taken away. She runs back to Simon Peter and to the other disciple who Jesus loved, and uh, John, and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So she didn't even catch the revelation yet that he had risen. They thought his body, she thought his body was stolen. So Simon Peter comes. We know John runs ahead. And then Simon Peter gets there, following him. And they went in the tomb, and they saw the linen cloths lying there. Again, now just bear with me for a minute. I know you've been very patient so far. Why did Jesus wait those extra couple of days? Couldn't he have been there and saved Lazarus from dying the first time? Yes, of course. But he said, watch. God's going to be glorified through this. Even though he's dead, God's going to be glorified through this. So even though your loved one is on drugs right now and you haven't talked to them in a long time, God's going to be glorified through their life because God can resurrect any dead situation. 
That's how we have to look at it. And if you're with people that don't believe that, it's okay that they don't believe it, but don't keep them in there in the room when you're believing for the miracle. Because this is a scriptural principle that unbelief is a stronghold. And that doesn't mean that you have to meet some great standard, but you need to have faith to the best of our ability. Again, I'm not trying to make this a works thing, but when you know people are living in that fear, they can get change from God. But right now when we're praying, we need people that believe this can happen. All right, I hope that's not done in any kind of defiling way. I'm not trying to defile anybody. Fear is just really wicked. It's a spirit. Forget that. Another teaching. The burial napkin, the kerchief, which had been around Jesus' head, was not lying with the other linen cloths, but was still rolled up, wrapped around and around in a place by itself. So here's the way I understand it, is they would use a bigger wrapping for the body, and then they would put a separate wrapping around the head. And when they walked in, those two things were still separated. Now, you would probably think that if somebody had come in to take the body and unwrapped it, they just would have unwrapped everything and threw it in a pile. Why else would he take this much time to talk about it like this? Like, he makes the point that the part that was around his head was still wrapped up as if it was around his head. Get in the picture? Had someone, this is a commentary, yeah, sorry, it says that somewhere. Had someone have an unwrapped the body, which would have been a complicated task in itself, gone to the trouble of laying out the cloths to create some kind of effect? So I guess the picture that he's trying to say, this commentator, is that when they walked in, the linen was still on the tomb and the, and the part around his head was still there. And if, you had, if somebody had unwrapped it, it wouldn't have been like that. So they're surprised. Like, I think that's why John is mentioning this. There it is, commentary. It looks as though the body wasn't picked up and unwrapped, but had just disappeared, leaving empty cloths. Like a collapsed balloon when the air has left it. And I don't know about you, but that excites me. Because that means the old man is gone. It disappeared, right? When Caiaphas in The Chosen, if you saw it, sees Mary Magdalene, it's the same body, but it's a different spirit. That old seven demons, they're long gone. They have disappeared. And now there's a new creation standing in front of him. And that's the way they explained it, the show. That's part of what convicts Caiaphas to want to follow Jesus is the change in someone else. Wow, how about you? Didn't that have an impact on you? In, in your walk to make a decision to Christ, did you see other Christians that had lived a life that had been in sin and now their lives were changed? Yeah, it's a witness. It's a testimony of the power of God. I'm going to finish here. Mary remained standing outside the tomb sobbing. Okay, now remember, the, the fact that she's the first person that sees the risen Christ is scandalous to religious people because she's a woman. And she had been a very, very sinful woman. If we were going to judge anybody, we would have been judging Mary. She can't be the hero of the story. It's got to be a man. Women aren't even allowed to preach. Ouch. You wouldn't believe the hate mail we get for the women that we show on YouTube. Anyway, I'm not saying anything about those people, Lord. Give them a revival. I married a preacher. <laughs> I married a prophet. What am I supposed to do? Like tell her she can't talk? Not doing that. If I want to live. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, just think about the, the, the weightiness of the fact that it's Mary out of whom seven demons were cast. Like that should give you so much hope that no matter what the situation is, that old person just disappears. Like, the body was there, gone. Still the cloth, no body. Jesus just vaporized and new creation. And now this new body is very different than the old one. A, an upgrade. Hmm. And she saw two angels white sitting there and at the head, one at the head, one at the feet where the body had been. And they said, why are you sobbing? She told them, because they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. 
on saying this, she turned around, and Jesus was standing there, but she didn't recognize that it was him. And he said to her, woman, why are you crying? For whom are you looking? Supposing that it was the gardener. The gardener? Genesis? Adam tending the garden? This is the new Adam. This is the last Adam. The first Adam messed it up. Now we got a new gardener. Oh. She replied, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher or master. So that's the completion of the cycle. That's what we're looking for when I showed you that graph that we go low to go higher. We get revelation. Every time we're willing to crucify our flesh and let that thing die that he's showing us, take the higher road like Joyce Meyer did when she had to forgive her father. A horrible story, but like great redemption at the end, right? Like she just had to put her flesh down. Her initial response when she knew that the Lord was telling her, you have to forgive your father, she said, no loving God would ever ask his child to do that. And that's how our flesh often reacts. Because Jesus said, it's a new commandment I'm giving you. You have to love others the way I loved you. You receive the love. It's right in the Lord's Prayer. As you forgive others, you'll be forgiven. If you're holding on to stuff, then how can that exchange work? It's reciprocity. As you do, you receive back. Amen. Can we stand? I just pray something burns in tonight. That he will do a lot of things symbolically for us. Again, why did Jesus wait? I think the reason he waited was to make the situation look even more impossible. <laughs> because it took him three days. He said, four days. I'm going to raise in three days. But even if your thing is dead for four days, I could still raise it. It's never too late. Nothing should get you so discouraged that you want to bail. Maybe somebody's watching online today. Who knows? It could be a very discouraging situation that you're in. I just want you to know nothing's too hard for God. That we've all been through situations that we were in such despair, we didn't know what to do. But in, in Second Chronicles, it says, well, Lord, when we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. So that would be a really good thing to remember, that regardless of the pain, regardless of the brokenness of your situation, regardless of you've been praying for years about something and not seeing the situation change. In a moment, it can turn around. He's the God of the turnaround. 360, do that with me, all right? Just do one of these. Say, he's the God of the turnaround. Man, when you're not sure and the devil's trying to lie to you and he's accusing you, you just say, nope, he's the God of the turnaround. He's the God of the 360. I'm looking this way, he comes up from that way. And man, he's got all kinds of surprises. Maybe we can lift our hands. So though we just want to be vessels your, your word says that in a, in a great house there are vessels, many vessels, some to honor, some to dishonor. We want to be vessels of honor in the house of the Lord. We want to live a pure, pure life, not out of legalism, but out of relationship with you, Lord, that we want to please you. We want to live to please you. And all our decisions, Lord, we want to be geared towards fulfilling the mission that you have us here on. And whatever the enemy's trying to use against us, we say, cancel it in the name of Jesus. Cancel it in the authority and the power that you've given us. Cancel it in our minds when we have the wrong thinking. Give us the power to take every thought captive. Holy Spirit, what a gift. What a gift came into the world when you came on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that we would be people that would not yield to our flesh, but we would yield to your presence in our lives, that our lives would be the temple of your spirit in us, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Can you say that? We welcome you. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, that my life would be a temple and I would be a living sacrifice for Jesus. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.